Hello, welcome to um, our webinar, kind of an introduction to Islam. My name is Reverend Brianna Ilene, and I am the Content Curator and Ecumenical Innovation Coordinator at the Wisconsin Council of Churches. It is a long title, but it means I do all kinds of fun things, such as this webinar, where I help I get to help bring us together to think about where we are called to work in our communities. Um, the Wisconsin Council of Churches is an organization that has 21 um, member denominations, and our goal is to bridge and bring people together across difference. And so today we are delighted um, to be talking about Islam. Wisconsin has been um, the place where we've got folks from Afghanistan, a majority Muslim country, who are have come and are at Fort McCoy now and um, maybe settled throughout Wisconsin. And so we are here to kind of talk a little bit about what does it mean to be hospitable to our neighbors. And I am, we are, our event is co-sponsored by the Interfaith Conference of Greater Milwaukee. And so Sherry, if you want to introduce yourself. Uh, hello everyone, Sherry Hansen here. Um, so for anyone that doesn't know, the Interfaith Conference is 52 years old this year. It's a nonprofit, multi-faith organization um, comprised of two or 22 member denominations and faiths um, that explore an internal dialogue with each other. Um, and then uh, externally do programs uh, that are built um, by committees to educate and create a lot of understanding. One of them is the Amazing Faiths Dinner Dialogue. Um, and so we invite the public to come and learn. Um, so yeah, I'm a program director. And my name is Sherry Hansen. And we're so delighted that Uthman Ada is joining us today to, um, to really just give us the foundational pieces so we can understand Islam, we can understand um, Afghanis, we can also understand how we can help them and uh, what it's like to be a refugee. So Othman. All right, thank you both very much. Um, that, that's actually putting a lot on my plate, uh, Sherry. So I, I'm going- <laughs> No problem. <laughs> I'll also solve the climate crisis and a couple other things. All right. <laughs> uh, I, I'm going to give you, you know, to the best of my ability, you know, my um, obviously views, uh, experiences, uh, talking a bit about the religion and the culture. I mean, as I think all of you um, are, are aware, um, you cannot um, fully describe any particular group in, or community or, or religious faith um, because um, everyone is, is very different. Their level of practice or commitment or cultural baggage or whatever else uh, that, that comes into play um, differs. But I think we could have a good conversation and, and kind of talk about what are uh, you know, some of the, the important um, factors and, and kind of the common um, items. Uh, I am, uh, I've been uh, affiliated with the Islamic Society of Milwaukee for uh, a long, long time. Um, my, my parents actually were one of the individuals who, who helped establish the organization uh, here in the Milwaukee area. Uh, we operate um, three religious facilities. We have a full-time K uh, through 12 school on, on two campuses. And uh, so I'm serving right now as a, as a director of the organization. So um, let's get into it, I guess. And, uh, you know, and again, I, I, the one thing I just want to say from the outset, um, you know, if anyone has any questions, I, because I, there's no way I, we're going to be able to, or I'm going to be able to, um, you know, talk about all the different potential issues and, uh, you know, things. If people have questions, there, there's, uh, I have very thick skin, uh, just so, so you guys are aware. So I'm not offended by any question. So ask whatever you want to ask if there's something or you want some clarification. Um, I think that's the purpose of the webinar is just, you know, that we will have a conversation and, uh, um, you know, try to improve a, a better understanding between all of us. So if you have, I forgot to say, if you have a question, go ahead and put it in the Q&A button um, that's down on your screen. You can type it there and then we'll try to get to them at, either in conversation or at the end, we have kind of a chunk of time set aside for question and answers. So go ahead, Sherry. Sorry. Oh, 
Um, yeah, I think that um, our audience here today probably um, there's a bandwidth of people that understand, and then there are people that honestly might not even know where to start in asking questions. I mean, I hear that a lot. Like, how well, I don't even know enough to ask a question. So, yeah, like, please don't be shy. Um, Achman's got thick skin, so you know we can, uh, you know, ask him anything. So. Well, I think maybe to um, to begin, um, let's talk about the um, Muslims come from different countries. There's a diversity, um, and then that would probably be a good way to get into talking about um, Muslims in Afghanistan as well. So, Othman, can you kind of break that down and 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 tell us about the different countries that are? Sure. In yeah, I mean, worldwide, and and most of the um, the statistics that, that I'm going to cite or the numbers um, are based, to the best of my recollection, on uh, usually studies like the Pew Center on Religion. Uh, they actually do some, you know, amazing work and um, you know, studying uh, faith communities in in the United States and different parts of the world. So we start off really. I mean, if we're talking about just the Muslim community in in general. Uh, worldwide. I mean, there's uh, the estimate, it's approximately 1.7 billion uh, Muslims worldwide, second in terms of uh, faith community um, to Christianity, which is, um, you know, the the, the most uh, uh, populous world worldwide. Um, Muslims come from from many different countries. And, um, you know, I, uh, the, the largest countries, I, I, again, I would assume that some of you may know the most populous Muslim countries in the world. Um, you know, Indonesia is, is number one. Um, but you also have, uh, um, you know, in India, where Muslims are not the majority, it's obviously it's a uh, largely Hindu country. But um, the number of Muslims, if you're 15% of a billion or so people, you're, you're a lot of people there. Um, and, you know, you have in Pakistan and, and other um, countries, so quite a few. Here in the United States, does anyone have any idea? I mean, and you could put this in, in the uh, chat, any idea of how many uh, Muslims or what percent of the population uh, in the United States are actually Muslim? Um, I mean, there's 330 million people in the United States. Uh, and so, you know, when you look at, because uh, we, we have, you know, there, there's sometimes some legislations that uh, certain politicians um, said that you know they're afraid that Muslims are going to impose their law uh, laws, you know, religious laws on on the rest of the country. Well, I think it would be important to to know uh, what the amount is. So we have you know one person said fifteen percent. So fifteen percent of uh, um, three hundred and thirty million would be about uh, forty some uh, million. Um, anyone else want to hazard a guess um, as to number of five percent? So about 15, 15 million. Um, in reality, in reality, that number um, is actually around two percent. Okay. Um, so the if if you go actually to the Pew Center on Religion, their numbers are actually uh, between one and two percent. Um, and again, this is there. There has been no census of the Muslim community. On the census, you you don't ask about religion. So there have not been any um, is real studies. There have been uh, you know where they take the numbers, where they try to actually determine what the numbers are. There have been a lot of different kind of studies to look at the number of mosques and attendees, and you know use different uh, figures. Uh, the biggest uh, or the best estimate, I would say, is probably somewhere between six to eight million Muslims um, in the United States. We're talking really around, you know, maybe two percent of the um, population. Well, let, let me ask any other question. I mean, if uh, the, and this is again from the Pew Center on Religion. If I said to you, you know, the Sikh community, um, what is the, their background, ethnic background? Um, you guys would probably know. You'd say, oh, you know probably overwhelmingly 90 some percent or more from India. Or if I said the Jewish community, um, again, according to the poll, overwhelmingly 90 percent or some uh, white. So what's the, the, the major ethnicity in the United States, uh, ethnicity or race of Muslims? What's the majority? If, if anyone wants to uh, take a guess on that one, um, you know, if, if you were, were going to, let's say, profile the Muslims and you say, okay, I want to profile them 
again, I'm against profiling, but it's, I'm just having a little fun with this. Uh, let's say you wanted to profile them. Um, what would you tell the law enforcement agencies to look for? I mean, what race or ethnicity, um, you know, would, would be important there? Someone says African American in the African American. Chat. Okay, you know, we'll, we'll come back to the, uh, because the, the the because of the nation of Islam, we can talk about that. That's a topic if you guys want to uh, discuss that. I can discuss that uh, quickly too. Um, no, it's it's not. Uh, there are African Americans that are part of the Muslim community. Let, okay, you know, let, let me be honest. It was a trick question because there <laughs> there is no majority race or ethnicity mm -hmm. among Muslims in the United States. It's actually the only major faith where there is in the United States where there is no majority race or ethnicity. And so you could be from the Middle East of Arab background, you could be from Southeast Asia, you could be from Turkey, you could be from Albania or Bosnia, you could be blue uh, eyed and, and blonde haired, you could have very dark uh, skin, you could be from Africa. Um, there is no majority race or ethnicity, and uh, which makes the whole concept of profiling pretty funny. Because it's like, okay, what's the profile, you know, of, of a Muslim? Uh, but you know, the, most Muslims um, pr prior to uh, 1900, um, the only real Muslims that came to the United States um, actually came involuntarily. They came on slave ships, um, and it is estimated that 20 to 25 percent of the slaves that were brought to the Americas were actually Muslims from Africa. Um, and some of them were highly educated Muslims, um, individuals who had memorized the Muslim scripture, who wrote in Arabic, who were sometimes much more educated than their slave masters. And there's a lot of information out there on that. But that was the first group of Muslims that came in. Ultimately, they were totally assimilated. There was no um, religion of Islam that passed through these uh, slaves to the modern era. What ultimately happened is you had immigrants coming in um, around the late 1800s, early 1900s. You had uh, Muslims coming in, particularly from what was greater Syria, Turkey, um, and so forth. Again, they came in small numbers. They were largely men. They intermarried here, and they totally assimilated, generally did not establish any kind of Muslim institutions, mosques, uh, centers, and things of that sort. And then the, the, you had the uh, Asian Exclusion Act that started uh, in the 19, I think, 20s or somewhere around that time, until the Immigration and Nationality Act of 1965, which actually um, coincided with the civil rights movement and a more fair immigration system, not something that was Eurocentric, but something that would allow people to come in from different countries, which is why ultimately, when you look at Muslims, why is there no majority race or ethnicity is because that was part of the Immigration and Nationality Act that Muslims would come in from different countries. And so the, the largest percentage of Muslims now, actually in the United States, are those who came from 1965 um, and later. Um, and um, that's when they started establishing um, Islamic centers, um, other institutions, um, and they started playing, you know, a, a you know more significant role. In terms of the African American Muslim community, that actually came out of the Nation of Islam, which was a black separatist non-Muslim movement. But ultimately, with the death of their lead leader Elijah, and then um, afterwards, uh, um, the the taking over by the son, they actually began to merge toward mainstream Islam. And so overwhelmingly, most African-American uh, Muslims now are mainstream uh, Muslims, not followers of the uh, Nation of Islam. Again, I'm sorry, it's, it's a very maybe long answer, but I just, uh, uh, it gives you a little bit about the diversity and, and the background of where Muslims came in this country. No, that's a, um, that's a great bit of information. I didn't know that. I, I don't know. I think that's really fascinating to know because, you know, I, and interfaith, we know where the masjids are, and um, and so that gives me kind of an understanding about uh, the history there. Oh, that's great. So, could you talk a little bit about? So, we've talked about the diversity of Islam. What do you know about Islam in Afghanistan and kind of that relationship? 
Well, you know, actually, Islam reached Afghanistan um, about only 100 years after the, the death of Prophet Muhammad, who Muslims believe received the revelation from God of what is the Quran, um, spreading of the idea of a monotheistic um, faith tradition that believes in prophets from uh, and messengers from um, Adam uh, and Eve to Noah and Abraham and Ishmael and Isaac and Jacob and and Jesus. I mean, Muslims believe um, in, in all of those, but it, it was only 100 years before uh, Islam actually reached in the area of, of Afghanistan. And it, Islam was there, um, you know, so you're talking about, uh, you know, 1300 years uh, now that Islam has actually been there. Um, it was a very vibrant um, community. Actually, there was for a long time, actually a very, for hundreds and hundreds of years, a very vibrant, actually even Jewish community um, within, under Muslim rule in um, Afghanistan uh, as well. And um, they they found out, and again, this is maybe kind of a side issue, but the, their, the Jewish community had storehouses of information because they didn't destroy, if something had God's name written on it, uh, they would not destroy it. They would put it in a, a what was called a Janiza. It, it's like a storehouse. And actually the oldest storehouses of Jewish information in the world, there's one uh, that was found in Egypt and uh, another that was found in Afghanistan. So it kind of gives a, even a, a, a history of, uh, of the Muslims there. What happened though in Afghanistan, uh, honestly, and, and again, without going into a long history, but you know, after the, the Islamic revolution that took place in, in Iran, and I think it was 1978, um, soon after that, the former Soviet Union invaded Afghanistan um, because they were afraid of many of the southern Soviet republics at that time, the different stands, Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, and others, becoming Muslim, um, or, you know, had, that the revolution in Iran would, uh, would affect them. So the former Soviet Union wanted to put a buffer, and so they invaded Afghanistan. Uh, they were there for 10 years, really devastated the country in, in many ways. Um, we supported the um, Mujahideen, that's... Uh, the Mujahideen is those who engage in jihad. Um, they they were invited to the White House, and uh, um, you know we we helped them with arms and and uh, support and so forth. Um, after the Soviet Union pulled out, um, we also pulled out rather than to helping build a country there and establishing, you know, um, a, a better life, you know, for these these individuals. We basically are left as well. And what happened was the country fell to different warlords, um, kind of just gangs that were, um, again, devastating uh, the country until eventually the Taliban, um, who means students, they actually were raised in the refugee camps in Pakistan. Um, some say supported by the Pakistani intelligence, uh, Saudi Arabia and, and other groups. Um, and they came in, they defeated the warlords, but then imposed a very rigid, um, you know, idea about Islam. You know, during the Taliban, of course, then Osama bin Laden was there, and you guys know the rest of the story. So from, you know, most of these people in Afghanistan have lived nothing but war. They have, obviously, the, the religion, they know their faith, they, but, you know, schooling has not always been uh, available. Um, you know, you have constant war and poverty and, and so forth. So, you know, before that, you used to have, uh, you know, the, the, the in in Kabul, they had universities uh, and everything else. I mean, it was a it was a regular, you know, society and country. But, you know, after decades of of wars and and so forth, and even during our reign in Afghanistan, I mean, most of the money we spent was not to develop the country. Um, overwhelmingly, the funds that we spent in Afghanistan was on the military, and you know, I don't think it's a surprise that. You know, uh, as soon as we decide to leave our forces, um, the the government you know collapses because you you didn't actually build a society or a, a, a country there. Again, I, I know that's a criticism, um, but it, it, that's you know my view of what the reality of the situation is. I think it could have been uh, different. You know, after spending twenty years and trillions of dollars, um, I, I think it's you know just kind of sad that you know you get back to the status quo ante. You know. Taliban were kicked out, and guess who was the first to to come back in? 
I, I, I hope I'm not sounding real pessimistic here. <laughs> I'm sorry. Well, there's never, people never, there's never a good story of why people end up being refugees in another country. Right. So I think it's important to know the context of why people, why people are coming. Um, it's not as simple as just, oh, they decided to move. There's a history, a long history. Yeah. And, you know, I, look, I mean, there, many of the people who are coming in, they're fearful maybe because you know they were working with contractors working with the the, the u.s military um there may be other you know reasons um you know why they needed to leave um now they're coming to the united states i mean this is the new batch of of immigrants um uh from everything we know you know and speaking to the people at um fort mccoy and, and other camps i mean they're, they're, they are practicing um, muslims um they um, that is, you know, they have an Afghani culture, um, um, but in, in terms of, you know, the, the religion, the faith, the the the, the diet, um, you know, the the holidays, all of that is, is going to be typical Muslim practices. I mean, people are discussing, you know, they, they're holding prayers there, they're holding Friday um, services. The Muslim services are on Friday, kind of equivalent to a Sunday service for Christians, where. They will have a sermon followed by the, the prayer. That th those are actually being conducted on the camps. Um, people are requesting, you know, uh, to maintain, you know, the dietary um, restrictions, um, and so that's, uh, um, you know, being handled uh, on the camps as well. Um, there's been requests for, you know, more conservative clothing, traditional uh, clothing, because that's, you know, what they're accustomed to. Um, so, you know. It, as with any immigrant, you come into a new society, you're going to hold on to uh, a lot of what your culture was, because that's what is makes you comfortable. I mean, that's what you're used to. And then over time, you know, uh, some of them will begin to, you know, uh, uh, take on some of the the culture of of their um, new home. Um, the children, obviously, more so than than the parents. And again, that's the story of, of of immigrants from you know every background that have come to the United States, and uh, also every background that has come to the United States, they've experienced you know xenophobia and and uh, things of that sort. I don't know if the Afghans will be different because these Afghans are considered to be those that were brought here because of their service, you know, to um, you know the United States and and so forth. Is is that going to make a difference? I think that for people who tend to be xenophobic, I don't think it matters very much, um, you know, what uh, the the reason that they they came here. I think there's just some people that tend uh, to be that way. Um, but you know, we're we're trying. We we're, we're going to do our best to make these people feel comfortable, to you know, incorporate them into our societies, get them to understand, um, you know, our cultures and and uh, you know traditions here, how they can actually maintain. Um, many things that they maybe had from back home and still be able to fit um, into this uh, country. Um, if they're in Wisconsin, uh, of course, we have to talk to them about the Packers and things like that. Uh, they, they need to understand which team um, they're going to be supporting, um, you know, not the Bears. Um, so, you know, all of those things are, are, are going to be important. Well, um, can you give us an idea of like how, because um, how many people are there? How many people are coming? How many people will be coming to Wisconsin? And then uh, don't forget to tell us how many babies were born in November. <laughs> or to be born in November. Um, oh, I see. Okay. Yeah. Who are, yeah. Um, <laughs> so, right. Um, as of a few weeks ago, the number of people who actually came, Afghans who came to Fort McCoy were 12,600. And that's because um, Fort McCoy is one of the bases where it, it's considered to be um, an area as, as like a, where they can hold them until they're vetted and released to the resettlement agencies. And so you have in Quantico, you have in Fort Dix, you have in a number of other um, locations throughout the United States. Um, now, overwhelmingly, most of those who are at Fort McCoy are not going to remain in Wisconsin. Actually, the number of uh, Afghans that they expect to remain throughout the entire state. Uh, the last numbers we had was um, 400. They expect that number to go up a little bit because there's a number of Afghans that were in uh, in uh, Germany and some other countries on their way here. 
Um, and so once all of them are, are here, um, the numbers that come to Wisconsin may be more than that. Um, you know, what happens is they try to settle them across the United States as in, in, in as many areas as they can, because it would be impossible, especially with the number of Afghans, you know, coming in. There were actually more than 100,000, if you include those who some had green cards and and some actually were, were, were citizens uh, already. But overwhelmingly, most were not, uh, they didn't have either status. But it's impossible to, to put them in, in one particular um, location. And um, the largest Afghan communities in the United States are actually in California and in the Virginia area, which are very expensive areas. Those who come in uh, as uh, under the special immigration visas or refugee status, um, they actually get very limited funds. Usually um, the amount that they get um, is gonna just let them you know, keep going for you know, less than a year's uh, period of time. They, they'll usually give them, I think, a, a stipend uh, of, or a pro rata per amount of, I think it's like $1,250 per family member. Well, you know, it, let's say it's a family of six, you know, it sounds like a lot, but that's all you're going to get. You're not going to get a monthly stipend. And so now you have to find a house, you have to pay the security deposit, you're going to have to get some furniture. And that's why, uh, you know, these resettlement agencies depend a lot on volunteers, on donations. Um, you know, if you go to California where the rent is $2,000 a month, you, you're not going to make it. And that's why they try to settle them in, in other areas where, you know, you may be able to get rent for five, $600 a month. Even in the city of Milwaukee, um, if it's a large family, you're not going to find um, a, a, an apartment unless you go to some of the more economically depressed areas in the city. But that then is going to pose a challenge. We saw that with actually some of the Syrians that came in. We had a couple of Syrian families that had nine, 10, and 11 members of the family. Well, nobody wants to rent to them. The only places that they could find were in you know, these economically depressed areas. Well, when they went to live there, it was more than a culture shock because you know, now there's all kinds of, you know, there, there's unfortunately you know, a lot of violence there, drug dealing and, and other things that were going on in, in some of these neighborhoods. Um, and that, that posed a problem. Um, imagine now you have so many Afghans all coming at one time. Um, how are they going to be um, placed? Um, you know, and, and the resettlement agencies um, are, you know, have only a skeletal staff because there were no refugees during really the Trump administration. I mean, these resettlement agencies were basically, you know, put out of, um, I, I don't want to say business, I mean, but what they were doing, I mean, they, they didn't have refugees to work, so they had to lay off their staffs or get rid of their staff. And, and now to try to bring people back, um, especially when, you know, it's hard to get an employee for anything. Mm -hmm. Try to get, you know, these individuals um, back and to work with, um, you know, uh, to try to get these Afghans, you know, to get them into schools, get them familiar with the society, make sure that, you know, they're settled in, they have the housing, they have, you know, uh, their needs. Um, it's, uh, it's a challenge. And we already are hearing some horror stories in some cities where a family is transported to a certain city and there's no one that comes to pick them up. Um, and, you know, we're just really concerned about, you know, how these people are going to be, um, you know, resettled. Um, it's it's going to be a challenge. Did you get to the number of babies born? Oh, I'm sorry. We were talking so, about this before we got, we went maybe, live. Yeah. So, so what, what we were told was that there, based on the, the number of people who are women who are pregnant, they're expecting between 20 to 30 children to be born at Fort McCoy in November, December, January, if the people actually stay there, that there will be a certain number of children um, who will be born there. And um, again, when you have 12,600 people, um, you know, uh, it's, I guess this is just something that, um, you know, has to be expected. And remember, they're at Fort McCoy, they're not used to uh, this many people um, coming in. These people didn't have anything except the clothes that they were wearing. And now you have to provide, you know, things for them. I mean, it's it's like you, you're, and they don't have like, oh, you know, let me go to, you know, my local Target or, or whatever and pick something up. They don't have anything there. Things have to all be, you know, brought in. And so 
for our organization, and and we've gotten support from um, you know uh, other Islamic organizations uh, here. We've had many churches who've uh, helped us, and when we are collecting, we actually have sent two semi loads full of clothing and um, other items to to Fort McCoy. I mean, these are 53 foot semis. Um, I mean, we we're doing whatever we can. There's many other people who you know are are donating and, and sending things, but uh, they're living in barracks, um, and there's a fear. I mean, even if if people are staying there. Um, especially in Wisconsin, it's not getting any warmer, um, you know, that uh, now people who used to, you know, for the last few months, they were walking outside, kids playing and running around. Now they're going to be confined to their barracks as it's getting, you know, colder. And so, you know, that, that poses its own um, issues, because some of these people already are suffering from trauma and, and, you know, psychological issues. And, you know, try to put all these people now to stay inside of a barrack. Um, you know, and not really have the opportunity to go outside. There's really no other activities or anything there. So that's why there's a push to to resettle them. But the resettlement system is broken. I'm sorry to say it's, again, it's just, it, it, it's not uh, at its full capacity at all, not even close. So I was thinking a little bit just about, um, like we, we were talking about Islam and people practicing faith. And I think about myself as a Christian, like I read the Bible, I celebrate Christmas and Easter. I um, maybe I go to church on Sunday. I've got these practices that mark me as a Christian. Maybe I wear a cross around my neck. You mentioned um, going to the mosque on Friday. What are some other practices that might mark someone as a Muslim that like, what does faith look like kind of in the everyday life? Sure. Yeah. I I mean, let, let me and again, I'm 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 uh, I'll give you this. Uh, obviously, you know, like with Christians, you're going to have people with different levels of you know practice and so forth. But in general, I'll, I'll just give you a because Afghanistan was a very traditional um, Muslim society, and so um, you know, it, I'll, I'll kind of give you just maybe a, in general what you would find. Um, if someone is uh, is praying, you have people who will pray the five daily prayers. Um, again, they could pray this at home. It doesn't have to be in a mosque or any other place. Um, people will pray if they're at work or they'll pray in other areas. So you have a five daily um, prayers that, that um, some people will conduct. But weekly, um, there is the Friday um, prayer service usually held at a mosque. In Fort McCoy, they actually have several um, in different areas. You know, um, It doesn't have to be a mosque. You could just have you know, a group of people coming uh, together and a uh, one person can, you know, do, uh, you could have a lay person. We, we don't have um, ordained staff for, for uh, Muslims in, in general, Sunni Muslims, especially. They, they don't, there's no ordination per se. And, and a religious leader is, is more like um, in, in Judaism, more of, of a scholar of religion and not someone who has religious authority. Um, so they could hold Friday prayer service. Um, most of them, I'm, I'm very confident, will adhere to Islamic dietary practices, um, no alcoholic uh, beverages, uh, you know, no pork um, products. Um, and again, that's something that even at the camps, we hear that, you know, they're requesting, you know, uh, for food that, um, uh, um, uh, you know, d- different, uh, that, that, you know, adheres to those particular um, uh, practices. Um, you have the dress. Um, generally, you know, Muslims are encouraged to wear modest dress. Um, for a lot of women, um, that uh, they understand that would include the hijab, which is uh, the the head covering. Uh, usually, what our experience is with with immigrants when they're coming in, they especially the the the, the parents, you know, the older, um, they will stick to some of their cultural dress for for some time, whereas others will you know, wear more, let's say, Western dress, it may still, you know, be, you know, modest. Um, But but that's something that, you know, is going to um, be, you know, significant as well. Muslims have two major holidays. Um, You know, we have the the fasting month of Ramadan, which I'm sure, you know, the the people coming in uh, are, you know, going to want to observe. Uh, Ramadan is not going to, uh, it's the ninth month of the Muslim calendar. Um, it's not uh, this year until April, so 
um, they have time to settle in a little bit before um, you know the, the fasting month comes in. At the end of the fasting month is our first major holiday, which is the holiday of the breaking of the fast. I mean, if you fast for you know 29 or 30 days, you get the party afterwards. And so um, the first party or the first uh, holiday, I should say, is uh, right after the fasting month. And usually a couple months later, uh, actually two months and 10 days later, there's a second major holiday for Muslims. And that is uh, the holiday of the sacrifice commemorating Abraham's willingness um, to um, comply with God's command. Um, and um, to say that what Muslims do is um, th there's a holiday there. There's th that holiday is, is uh, connected with a lot of other rites that Muslims have the pilgrimage uh, to Mecca and, and so forth. But most of that is even connected to the um, family of Abraham. So, you know, you'll, you'll see other Muslims in terms of, you know, in their homes, I'm sure they're going to yearn for, especially because they came with nothing from their home countries, they're going to yearn for some things that um, they were used to, um, whether, you know, they were, you know, are, you know, like pictures or um, particular, you know, you, even kitchen utensils or things that, you know, may, maybe they, they want some things that, or, or, you know, items that would remind them of, of their home country because they came you know, without any of that. And I'm sure that's going to take some time. They're going to, you know, become over time familiar with, you know, where they can get these uh, different supplies and, and things of that sort. You know, when it comes to uh, those who are living in more rural areas, they may, especially if they're strict on, on dietary um, items, um, it, it, that may pose a, a challenge. If they happen to be, you know, closer to larger cities like Milwaukee, or, or Madison, um, you know, you have many um, stores and restaurants that do, you know, comply with uh, Muslim dietary practices. Um, but those are the kind of things, I mean, uh, that, uh, you know, in terms of their, their daily lives, um, you know, you, you will see there, they're, again, immigrants, many of them are going to hold on to a lot of that just because um, that's what they're comfortable with, with that's what gives them still a, a sense of identity um, until they're able to navigate, you know, in the society that we're in right now and become more used to it. And I think that reminder to just always be curious, be learning, be listening. I think about, um, we've got friends, my spouse plays soccer and during the last Ramadan, there are multiple folks who would be like, oh yeah, I'm hungry because we're playing soccer. I'm like, oh, it's Ramadan. Yeah, you haven't eaten yet, have you? And they're like, nope, not till tonight. And then I said, you guys are amazing because I would not survive, especially not playing soccer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we, you know, we, we had uh, with kids, you know, we have a school and they're on sports team, competitive sports teams. And uh, they would be fasting. They're not going to break their fast until the sun sets, and uh, um, it, it is a challenge. But you know, if someone has that commitment, they're they're definitely going to do it. I mean, look, it, I I think that you know, like you, you know, you you said uh, the curiosity, just the openness, the discussion. I mean, I, I just think you know, even Wisconsin. I mean, people very friendly, um, um, you know, uh, to socialize with, to speak to. Um, some of them may be a little bit hesitant. Uh, many of them, particularly if their English isn't, you know, very good, um, you know, they're very nervous about trying to speak. They're unfamiliar with everything, so they're going to be very nervous to begin with. And um, and I think that just to to be able to have, um, uh, uh, you know, someone to to speak to to make them feel, you know, more more comfortable. Um, you know, I, I think that's uh, that's a good thing. One thing, and, and again, I'll, I'll tell you, it, because it's a more traditional society, I mean, I think this is something that's important. Generally, there isn't a great deal of mixing between uh, men and women in terms of uh, socializing. So if, you know, someone happened to go, there's a single mother who has kids, um, and a guy goes to her house, it's unlikely that she's going to let him in. Um, because again, there's just that's something culturally she's not used to. She may also, you know, just not know, be fearful. Um, uh, you know, even among you know couples. Um, and I'll tell you, I mean, uh, I'm you know I'm the director of a Islamic organization. Um, you will find some you know women who, um, when you greet them, most of the women at at the Islamic center, uh, for example, you greet them. I don't extend my hand uh, out to them because. Um, again, this physical contact is something that 
some Muslims uh, um, feel is, especially between, you know, unrelated, you know, individuals. And so I, I let them take the lead. I mean, if they want to, you know, extend their hand, that's fine. I'll, I'll extend my hand. Um, again, these are cultural, um, you know, and part of them connected to religion, of course, as well. Uh, but these are practices that if someone isn't comfortable with it, you know, don't be offended by it. So, you know, if you extend your hand and the person may, you know, say, oh, you know, I'm sorry or whatever, they're not trying to offend you. Um, even, even eye contact, um, some people in some of these cultures, especially if they come from villages, um, uh, the, whether a young person speaking to an older person, um, giving eye contact in some of these contexts, they seem like you're being really bold and like you're, you know, and, and so they, they will, you know, sometimes be looking down as a sign of humility and respect. So it's not that, oh, they're hiding something, you know, they're, they're, they're not telling the truth. Again, these are cultural things of, of a different um, society, you know, they, they have a different ways of doing things. And so just assume that it's not for a negative reason. It's not because of, you know, you know, some, some wrong reason. It's just part of uh, their culture and tradition. And, you know, uh, some of them, uh, over time, they may be, become much more comfortable with what we have here. Like I said, especially the, kill, the, the children. I mean, children are, are especially easy that, you know, they, they learn the, the new culture and, and, and uh, um, you know, how to navigate through it much easier than parents. Um, Sarah has a question kind of pertaining to what you're talking about um, as well about um, appropriate greetings. So um, how does maybe salam like I'm seeing I never get it right anyway yeah. unless I'm no, reading it, it but salam. no it's actually it's actually um, it's uh, well salam salam means peace okay so uh, alaikum means with you or on you so assalamu alaikum basically means peace be on you or peace be with you. Okay. It's just like in, in Judaism, they, it's, it's also a Semitic religion. So where they have, uh, you know, shalom, say, same root word, and, you know, the same expression. So, I mean, uh, you could even, if you don't, if you're very nervous about saying assalamu alaikum, you could just say salam, you could, you know, say whatever, um, and uh, people will understand that. And, and again, it's, it's a very kind and, and friendly gesture too to show that, hey, you know, we're, we're trying to use your language to greet you. Um, I, you know, I think that's a nice thing. So, okay, yeah, well, I mean, to know that it's, that it's taken that way as, a, as opposed to, or you're trying to be cool, trying to get your Arab down, you know, <laughs> <laughs> Arabic down and, you know, and then mess it up on a live webinar, so. Um, sure. yeah, no, no, it's, uh, you know, I, again, I, I mean, uh, <laughs> um, uh, the, the, the Afghans have different languages, which I don't, um, I, personally, I don't speak mm -hmm. those, those languages. Uh, some will speak Pashto, mm -hmm. some will, will speak um, um, Urdu. Uh, th there's a, a number of languages um, that, that are in, uh, in, uh, in Afghanistan. Um, and, and actually, this is one of the biggest challenges that even us as, as a Muslim community here, um, we don't have enough people that actually can speak the languages that the, you know, the, to, to communicate with the Afghans. And in Wisconsin, especially, there's more Afghans in, in Madison than Milwaukee. Um, but there's really not a lot of, of Afghan, uh, you know, people of Afghan descent, you know, in the Milwaukee area. It's really a small um, a number. And so whether it's they're speaking Dari or Pashto or Urdu or, you know, any of these languages, um, that, that's going to also be, you know, a, a challenge as well. But, you know, the, the it, it, from a Muslim perspective, the salam or salam alaikum is something that any Muslim out of the 1.7 billion in the world, you can go anywhere where there are Muslims and you can tell them salam alaikum or, you know, salam, and they're going to know exactly what you're saying. So um, that, that's, that, that's the easiest, probably the most common, you know, expression uh, in, in the Muslim world is, is, is that one. Well, you know what's cool about peace be with you? You know, that's what we say in church as church, well. Absolutely. Oh, absolutely. And, and that's why, yeah. I mean, yeah. especially among people of, of religion, it, it, it's a normal thing to say. So um, I think it's great. Maybe we should all say it. <laughs> you know, what, how would that be? I mean, I'm going to do that. This, let's, <laughs> let's commit to this all week when I run 
and you run into anyone, say, peace be with you, and throw them off. <laughs> <laughs> so we have another question um, about being culturally respect uh, respectful. Um, do you have suggestions for how we as Americans should dress when interacting as professionals or volunteers? For example, no low neck lines, no written messages and t-shirts, that sort of thing. Um, so there's that question and I'm gonna expand it a little broader as well as like, what does it look like to be hospitable to people? It, like, how do we do that? <laughs> You know, I, I think just like we would do if uh, someone new came into your neighborhood. And I mean, I know times have changed, okay? And sometimes nowadays you don't always know who your neighbors are and things of that sort. But I mean, I remember when I was growing up and, you know, um, I, I was, you know, obviously still very young, but, you know, you, you go into an area, people are coming, they're introducing themselves, you know, or some new person comes in and, you know, you get to know them, you find out, you know, more more about them. It's again, just it's a, you know, and I think all our religions teach this, you know, kindness to the neighbor. I mean, it's them as, you know, there, there's an expression that um, uh, a prophetic tradition, I should say, where um, someone actually said that, you know, the prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, kept talking about the importance of the neighbor and treating the neighbor and how to treat the neighbor and how to be kind to the neighbor and the neighbor you know you're, you're not a muslim if if you know you're eating your neighbor is hungry you're not a muslim if your neighbor is going through difficulties and you're not helping that this person said he spoke so much of the neighbor that i thought that there would eventually be a revelation where the neighbor would inherit from me okay i mean it was it was it was that much attention that was was given to the neighbor i think this is part of all our faith traditions uh you know, to to help uh, the neighbor, to be kind to the neighbor. I think that's what you know. Hospitality is, um, you know, see if they they need something, they they might need help. You know, especially with these new immigrants coming in. I'll tell you, they're not going to have, um, uh, and, and this is where the resettlement agencies try to get volunteers. They don't have a, a vehicles. They may need to go get a you know a, to a hospital. They need to figure out how to get their kids to school. They need to do you know all kinds of things. Um, they need to apply, you know, for something. Go to a government office. Do do whatever. Um, you know, if if there there are volunteers who are available, who, people, you know, who can actually help in some way or the other. I mean, I, I think all of that um, it, it would, you know, fall under hospitality and, and and neighborness and whatever. In terms of interaction, again, yes, you know, people tend to be. Um, you know, it, it, more conservative in terms of their, their dress and, and, and whatever. I mean, uh, we have people coming into our Islamic centers from, you know, different communities all the time. And we just say, you know what, just come in as you would, you know, kind of like, a, a, you know, in a church. Most of the time, people are going to come wearing, you know, something that's appropriate to a church. They're not going to dress as they're going to go to, you know, a club or something like that. And so, you know, it just, you know, dress... Uh, and you know something that's that's appropriate uh, when it comes to let's say going to visit them and whatever else. I, I don't I don't uh, you know you don't have to and and I'll tell you I, I you know I, and again I truly respect the people who do this, but it's not necessary. There are people who come to visit the Islamic Center, especially older um, women, probably because this is maybe what they were used to in churches in the past, and they would come in and they would put a scarf on their head. And they say, look, I'm, I'm putting this scarf. And I said, do you usually wear that? Oh, they said, no, no, but because I know, you know, you Muslims, you wear the scarves. And so out of respect, you know, I, I just want to do that. And honestly, I, I, I'm really floored when, when they do that. I mean, it's really not necessary. We don't require it um, here um, when they come to visit. But again, I would definitely take it as, as a sign of, you know, they're really, you know, trying to be just respectful. Um, and, you know, I, again, that's something... Um, I, I really honor, you know, the, the, these people, but I, I, I'm not saying that that, that would be necessary. Because remember, even when these Afghans were in Afghanistan, they were working with contractors and and government, uh, you know, uh, Americans, and you know, th they were just, you know, they're used to it now. And um, I, I don't think there should be any issue with any of that at all. Well, I was going to say uh, a friend of mine who is Palestinian Muslim. He would say that every night um, my mother would take, have me take a plate um, 
to the neighbor. And then the plate would come back with food, for, you know, from them. I said, but what if you both had like mansaf for dinner? <laughs> you have the same. Yeah. And, and it doesn't matter. So, um, you know, there are certain things that are universal and good food is one of them. So, I mean, how more hospitable could you be to like take, you know, food or um, of course, you know, not pork and you know minding the dietary restrictions but and no jello salad sorry all you well, yeah. that, but well, let's, yeah. so let, let, let me oh, let me tell you. i mean yeah I, 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 <laughs> um, <laughs> you know, there, there's so there's there's so many stories about that i, mean, I was I was sitting with someone the other day that um uh they, they had gone to this restaurant um and just they had great food and uh uh, apparently, uh, one guy who, who had gone to the restaurant, he, who was a, an, an immigrant, and he asked them, um, it, it was a barbecue, and you're going to figure out, there were ribs. And he asked them, um, is this, this is according to his story, he asked them, is this meat? Okay, and I think he was wanted to ask, is this beef? But he asked, is this meat? And apparently, Whoever was serving him said, yes, of course it's meat. And so he went and ate it. Um, and then he brought a friend the next time. And the friend was a little bit shocked. And he goes, did you ask him, you know, what this is? And he says, yes, I asked him, is this meat? <laughs> and, <laughs> well, they were, of course, pork ribs. Um, <laughs> I, I mean, it, things happen with new immigrants when they come into this country. Um, you know, it's not like they're going to hell if they make a mistake, all right, it, it happens. Um, we've had, and I remember when I was young, neighbors that would, you know, bring us some things which we knew we we couldn't eat. Or there was, you know, a package of it had, um, um, you know, cookies and it had lard in it, for example. And so, you know what, we would then, you know, just give it, it you know, to you know, and say, oh, you know, we're sorry. We'd explain it to them, or we'd give it to someone else. You know, just pass it on to someone who can who can eat it. Um, you know, it, the, these kind of things happen. Generally, anything that has pork or pork products um, is something that um, you should avoid. So if it has lard in it, um, many things, if it just has shortening, usually it's, it's lard. Um, but other, otherwise, most things other than meat, um, you shouldn't really have um, a, a problem. Chicken is usually not a problem. The only time, there, there are some people who will ask to eat only um, food that is uh, slaughtered, the meat that is slaughtered according to Muslim traditions. That's a much smaller segment of the Muslim community. So I, I would say maybe, I don't know, I'm just guessing, maybe like 20%, 30% may only eat you know, that kind of, of meat. Um, and so in those situations, you know, if you happen to have a a Middle Eastern, you know, restaurant or someplace that sells food. Let's say you wanted to take, you know, something, some food to them. You know, if, if actually desserts are always a good bet. Um, but if you were gonna, yeah, and I, you know, desserts are always preferable for me. But anyway, if if you wanted to take, let's say, some other dish, um, you know, nowadays, especially in in the, the bigger cities, you'll find a lot of restaurants that'll tell you this is halal or halal, what's called zabiha which really really just means it's according to a uh, you know stomach requirements and actually you can even go to you know stores like now um or distributors i think like restaurant depot and they have a halal section um you know uh, and in areas where there's a lot of muslims like uh in michigan uh, you could go and get uh, go to mcdonald's and, and get halal food it may not be good for your health but it's still halal you know <laughs> So um, I, I'm kind of I kind of know the answer, but I would love to hear it from you, Uthman. Is the um, what's up with the pork? What is the historical um, or reason? I mean, is that okay? You can. I mean, I, I'm not going to give you an answer. Um, <laughs> I, I all I'll tell you is, look. I mean, the reason we don't eat pork is because 
um, the Islamic Society. Uh, uh, no, I'm sorry. I was reading this while I was talking to you. I'm sorry. The reason we don't eat pork, not because of the Islamic Society. We got nothing to do with that. Um, I, I read the chat while I was talking to you. I just somehow it just popped up. Uh, the reason uh, um, pork is because the Quran says no pork. Reason we don't consume alcohol is because the Quran says don't consume alcohol. Now, have um, scholars tried to, you know, figure out what's the reason? Yeah, I mean, people have said there's different reasons why this may be important. I mean, it's much easier for me to give you arguments about alcohol than, than, I, than about pork. But, you know, we also believe that even, you know, in, in the, uh, uh, if you go to the Old Testament, I mean, there, there's things about, you know, the, the uh, swine as, as well. Um, again, I, I don't want to go into the reasons that, you know, some of these scholars over, you know, the centuries, and even nowadays, we have biochemists that will tell you how, you know, pig fat is, um, you know, how it's broken down in the body different than other kinds of, fat. I mean, without going into all of that, the reason we don't do it is because according to the faith, it says, you know, don't do it. And we feel that God has, um, would not, you know, tell us to do something unless it was for, you know, our benefit in, in, in some ways. And so that's why um, we actually uh, follow it. So I'm, I'm sorry, I, I know I avoided your question, but you know. <laughs> Mike, <this> you're is... <laughs> up. <laughs> I really thought I was gonna get an answer. I mean, wow. Okay, we respect you. <laughs> so I wanna say thank you for answering these questions. Like so many questions, we've covered so many topics. And I think you kind of said in the beginning, like we just touched yeah. and it's- I, well, I'm it's surprised, is it, oh my God, is an hour 26 minutes? Wow, that has gone by fast. I think I was talking too much. I'm sorry if I talk too much. <laughs> that You're is our special cool. guest. So my my final question is is if if someone wanted to learn more about Islam, what what should I do? How should I go learn more? You know, I um, my my personal feeling is uh, I mean there's there's sometimes you know good. Um, websites, um, especially institutes. There's there's a, a, a very good um, and and scholars, well known scholars. Um, like y there's a Yakin Institute that is down in in Texas. Um, there is uh, um, there's one called uh, a site called Islamic City. Um, otherwise, um, visit a, 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 an Islamic center. Talk to someone you know who. Um, uh, is is Muslim. I I mean my honest feeling is if you really want to learn, you know, is you talk to people who are part of it, because then you'll also see the diversity. I mean, just like me, I mean, I could read a book about, you know, you know, Christianity, and I could read the Bible, but I, I may not learn a lot about how someone is practicing it. And, and if I just take one person, that person is may not be reflective of, you know, may, many others. So I honestly feel that, you know, interaction between people, um, yes, I think the education, the learning about it um, is, is important as well. There's resources that can be found um, at, um, you know, different Islamic centers and, and different organizations uh, uh, that, that will, you know, provide you with different, you know, resources online. The problem online is, you know, you try to figure out what's good and, you know, what's bad. But if it seems to be a, a well-known scholars or, or institute, um, they, they'll provide, you know, quite a bit of information. But I, I honestly believe the personal interaction um, and gaining knowledge that way is, is probably the best. Well, um, I, I totally agree with that. I think that firsthand experience and, um, and be ready for um, the, the, um, the differences too. So the um, Interfaith Conference has the Amazing Faith Dinner Dialogue. That's, right. That's a great opportunity. That's what that program is all about. Like, yeah, and I've, I've been part of those amazing dinners, and they are amazing dinners. Oh, thank you. Yeah. And also, there's networking brunch um, at the. Um, um, I also work for Uthman's sister, Janan Najib, at the Milwaukee Muslim Women's Coalition. It's a, a new position for me. I'm absolutely thrilled. Um, and I have been to their networking brunches. They're on pause right now because of COVID, but. Um, yeah, COVID's kind of getting in they, the way. They also, they also have a lending library there where you can yes. check out books and things of that sort. Yeah, it's a really awesome library too. So um, do you have programs also um, at the Islamic Society in Milwaukee? 
Thank yeah, you. we. I mean, we, we have some programs open to the public. We have uh, we obviously, as usually as part of the interfaith and other groups, we do some interfaith programs as well, um, educational programs. We sometimes have social uh, programs as well. We have a Thanksgiving program with some churches here in the area of the Islamic Center. That was pre-COVID. Hopefully, we're going to try to have that again this year again. So, but yeah, I look. It's in my view, um, you know, it, it's all about. Um, interacting with with people, learning about people, um, and that's the greatest way to, um, you know, increase understanding and you know, uh, and an appreciation of what others are are like. Especially, you know, you, you do it without, you know, being judgmental, without whatever. It's it's like, hey, they're just like us. You know, they they may have some different practices and and whatever, but in the end, you know, we we have much much more in common than what um, differentiates us from one another. Yeah, we're all just human beings trying to figure this all out, right? <laughs> so. Well, thank you so much. Um, and I just want to give a little preview. We will be doing a second webinar on November 23rd at 2 p.m. Um, that will be looking kind of more, even more specifically at the history and culture of Afghanistan. So um, pay attention. For the We'll have more information coming very soon. We just haven't got it in it gotten it out yet. Um, it was a delight um, to learn with you today. And so thank you so much. Thank, thank yeah. you very much uh, to the both of you. And thanks for all the guests who uh, joined us as well. And I appreciate this very much. Yeah. Thanks to everyone who came. Othman, thank you for your time. And Brianna, you're so much fun. I can't wait to work with you again. So take care, everyone.